Welcome everybody that's already joined. Um, I'm going to give a couple more minutes here to see who else joins us. Well, I can go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Krista Lebrecht. I'm the Restoration Program Manager for Tillamook Estuaries Partnership and the Project Manager for the Sitka Sedge Tidal uh, Wetland Restoration Project. Um, I think we'll just go ahead and start uh, going around and introducing everybody. So I'm just going to call on folks. Uh, Noel? Hi, everyone. Noel Batchelor. I'm the Central Natural Resource Specialist Ecologist for Oregon State Parks. Sorry, Jason. Hey, everybody. Jason Elkins, Park Manager for uh, the Cape Lookout Management Unit with Oregon State Parks, um, including Sika Sedge State Natural Area. Hunter. Hi, everyone. My name is Hunter White. I'm a civil and water resources engineer with ESA, and I'm leading the team of uh, ESA and sub consultants uh, working on the design and permitting process for the project. Uh, Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Laws. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Confederated Tribe of the Siletz Indians. Thank you. York. Hello, everyone. Uh, York Johnson with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, North Coast Basin Coordinator, I'm also in a shared position with the Tillamook Estuary Partnership. Justin. Good afternoon, uh, Justin Parker, uh, State Parks North Coast District Manager, which includes uh, Cape Lookout Union. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Hey, y'all. Jennifer Jones with the NOAA Restoration Center. Uh, Dennis. You're muted, Dennis. Sorry about that. I'm Dennis Comfort. I'm the Coastal Region Director with Oregon State Parks. Um, uh, Celeste. Hey, everybody. Celeste Lebo with the uh, Partners for Fish and Wildlife program with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Thanks. Uh, Liz? Hey, everybody. Liz Ransom. I'm the director of the Salmon Superhighway Project, and I work for Trout Unlimited. Uh, Stephen, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, too? <laughs> Hi everyone, Stephen Johnson here with ESA, uh, here just supporting the meeting. Thanks. Luke? He may have stepped away for a second, he'll be on oh, a little bit. Uh, okay. Luke Johnson is a watershed ecologist and permitting specialist with ESA, and he'll give us a brief overview of our uh, permitting approach for the project. Okay. Um, Mike? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Sennett. I'm the Assistant District Fish Biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, North Coast Watershed District. Um, Chris. Chris Lady, I'm the County Public Works Director and the County Engineer. Uh, Adriana. Good afternoon. I am Adriana Morales, District Fisheries Biologist for U.S. Forest Service Hibo Ranger District. Um, Sarah. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Kaufman. I am the Assistant Wildlife Biologist for the U.S. Forest Service Hibo Ranger District. Thanks. Claire? Hi, this is Claire. Uh, I am the Coastal Habitat Project Coordinator with the uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development, uh, and I'm uh, partnering and assisting with Krista on applying for funding. Thanks, Claire. Jasper? Hey, 
in the chat said he's working on some audio issues. Oh, okay. Well, Jasper works for um, Tillamook County Public Works as well. Correct. Uh, Meg? Hi, Meg Reed, the Coastal Policy Specialist for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. I'm just um, sitting in for Lisa Phipps today. Good. I believe that is all of us. Um, so just a little housekeeping. Um, so please save your, the, so the panelists will be able to ask questions. Um, the uh, attendees watching the webinar will not at this time. We're going to have a town hall meeting in a couple, uh, three weeks or so, um, where uh, that will be the, the venue for questions from the public. Um, and we'll, a, a bunch of us will be there for that. Um, and Panelists, if you could hold questions uh, until um, after Hunter's presentation uh, of the 30% design details, that would be awesome because we have a lot to run through today and we don't have, uh, it's going to be tight on time. So um, I think that's, oh yeah. And so for community members who are, are joining us, um, there will be a recording of this available at least for a few weeks uh, on the TEP's YouTube channel. And um, we will also be able to provide the recording of this um, by requests after that point. Um, so I guess with that, I will turn it over to Noel um, to tell us a little more with some slides uh, about the project. Yeah, thanks, Krister. Um... So my role here today is kind of as the historian for this project. It's been going on for, for quite a while. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Is it visible? All right, thank you. Um, sorry, just a second. There's a bunch of stuff on top of it for me. Um, yeah, so this project has been going on since about 2014 in one form or another, and uh, there's a lot of background to cover. So I'll go quickly through a summary. A lot of you have already heard this, but it may be new to some of you. First, to kind of set the stage of location where we're talking about Sitka Sedge State Natural Areas in Tillamook County on the North Coast, and the red boundary that you see on the map here is the park boundary. The dike, the existing dike, is Belt's Dike. This was built in the 1930s and has a single tide gate in this location. In the past, it used to have tide gates at least here and here that have since failed and were left with this smaller possible replacement tide gate that came in at some point in the past. The major salmon bearing streams here uh, are Renneke Creek and Belts Creek, which have been behind the dike, with which is a fish passage barrier since the 1930s. So the production of salmon there has been pretty limited. There's also a few other waterways from the south. Tierra del Mar Ditch is one. There's the Sand Lake Road Ditch and No Name Creek through what we've been calling East Marsh through the, the course of this project. Tierra del Mar is the community immediately to the south of the property, and it has a couple of properties which are within the reach of uh, tidal elevation. And with that, I will move on to sort of our purpose and need here, why, why we're here, why we're talking about this, and what's caused us to undertake the effort that we're in now. First of all, the, the current tide gate is failing. The pictures that are on the side of the screen over here depict the current tide gate, which is about a four by four square box culvert with a top hinged steel flap that used to have four planks on it that prevented incoming tides from rushing through the dike. This is the outside of the dike, prevented the water from flowing into the marsh behind the dike. Since all of those boards are now miss missing, the water blasts through the small uh, box culvert like a fire hose, and the velocities are, are fairly extreme. Sometimes there's even foam on top of the water from the amount of speed that we're seeing here. That speed, of course, is a, a detriment to fish that are trying to get through this culvert, and it doesn't really have much fish, fish passage currently. Um, the other element of this dike that needs to be discussed as well is that the dike is undersized according to current standards and its low point is only 12.2 feet 
the highest tide ever recorded in this area is 12.2 feet. So sea level rise is not something that this dike can withstand at current. So with that, I'll show this slide. I'm not going to read through all of this. Don't worry. This is sort of a timeline of everything that has gone on to study the dike and tide gate and fish passage and all of that kind of stuff over the last 10 years. There is a long and storied history here of a lot of uh, analysis. Also over that time period, there have been at least 22 stakeholder meetings that have been open and advertised to the public and new, uh, news releases, website, an email list that we maintain to get word out to stakeholders. We've had meetings with adjacent landowners and ongoing email collaboration with uh, Tierra del Mar Community Association and other interested landowners. This, of course, is on top of um, relationships that have been in place with this tech team or other iterations of this team with different membership over these long 10 years. So some of the scenarios that we've addressed over the over the years uh, are the no action alternative. Of course, every project always has to have a situation where you assess what if we do nothing at all? And that is something that we ad have definitely analyzed and what the effects could possibly be from doing nothing. Dike breach is on the other end of the spectrum. What would happen if there was a hole in the dike, if the dike failed, et cetera, or what was the historic condition of the marsh and the lands behind the dike prior to the dike's construction. Then we've also assessed an array of different items related to setback or to muted tidal regulators in the existing dike. Most recently uh, analyzed a pair of 10 foot wide by eight foot tall uh, muted tidal gates that have different closure settings that can be adjusted. So. We analyze settings from a seven foot closure setting, an eight foot closure setting, nine and 10, and then what the effects might be from those different closure settings on hydrology and habitat, et cetera. And then the relative newcomer to our analysis coming in 2019 was the idea of setback dike. And the setback dike would involve construction of a new modern uh, dike with a modern tide gate to the southern end of the marsh and then breaching the existing dike and bridging it or using a boardwalk to allow uh, continued recreational traffic across the marsh. This uh, setback dike in the southern portion of the marsh would allow unfettered fish passage to both Belts Creek here and Renneke Creek here and would allow for rearing habitat and marsh habitat enhancement in general in most of the marsh uh, uh, north of the setback dike. This figure shows some of the analysis that we did of these different tide gate closure settings as well as the setback dike in showing the frequency of inundation that would be expected inside of the dike under each of these different scenarios. And you can see here in, in these colors that this purple color is 20 or more days of inundation in the month of February. And under the existing condition, because of the small aperture in the existing tide gate, water is not able to rush in to the extent that it can fill the marsh before the tide goes back out again. Under these other scenarios of muted tidal regulators and modern tide gates, more water is able to come in more quickly, but it's also able to more quickly leave and in the situation of the setback dike, really no significant uh, frequency of tidal inundation occurs at all in the area south of the setback dike. There's some coloration here that's it would basically be water that would be entering the tidal channels and spreading out just a little bit from the, the channels that are in the marsh already. The one thing to notice here is that under a historic condition, pre-dike or under a situation in which the dike were no longer to be present, breached or to fail, you would see that there would be significant water on private properties in Tierra del Mar, uh, you know, some number of days from 20 days plus in some areas at the north end to just a couple of days down in some of the southern areas of private property to the south of, uh, of the property line. 
And this video kind of shows all of that in a uh, graphical way. And I'll kind of point out some things on the slide that are going on. This is the existing condition here. This is the existing dike. This is a modern tide gate with a seven foot opening, I think. I can't see the top of my slide. And this is the eight foot setting. Sorry, I wish I could see what is underneath this toolbar thing. Um, and this is the setback scenario. So what we'll notice here, I'll zoom this forward into a 50 year storm event approximately. And the phenomenon to notice here is that under a 50 year flood event of storm water entering the marsh, the existing condition is the worst possible scenario. It fills up with water and actually the water can stay in for days uh, because of this very small hole through the dike in this four by four opening where the existing tide gate is. All of the other potential alternatives drain out very quickly. As you can see here, these have all drained out while water is still being retained inside of the, um, uh, the marsh. So then I will forward this, fast forward this onto a 100 year storm event coupled with a 12.2 foot king tide. And what we'll notice here is that after a big storm event, of course, same as a 50 year event, the existing condition fills up with water and it stays filled for, for many days on end, whereas all of the other situations drain out. With the king tide addition, what we will see, this is the breach scenario here. I can tell now that I uh, can see what it's doing, although there's a control bar on the top that blocks my title screen. The breach situation brings a lot of water into these properties here, whereas the other alternatives do not uh, allow as much water in there to those properties. So that's kind of an extreme scenario, but you'll see here that the existing condition is the worst of all. There's water way up into these private properties for a long period of time. Breach, lots of water up in there. The other scenarios of modern tide gates and setback dike dramatically limit and dramatically improve the water situation um, in Tierra del Mar. So OPRD developed some sideboards and goals related to what the agency wants to see in any kind of action related to the dike and the marsh. And I'll just read these off quickly. The design should result in virtually no increase in tidewater, stormwater, or elevated groundwater on private properties in Tierra del Mar. Second one is design should result in meaningful improvements to estuary and fish habitats in the area inside the existing dike. The design should restore fish passage to the mouths of Renneke and Belts Creeks. Recreational access needs to be a given. People still need to be able to get across the marsh, experience the marsh up close. And the design should route Renneke Creek to the marsh naturally rather than in an artificially constructed and channelized path, including near the parking area where there was a, an excavated uh, channelized ditch-like feature that conveyed water in the past, or like it is now, in the roadside ditch along Sand Lake Road. So the pros and cons of each of these summaries, the, the no action alternative doesn't really have any pros. This The situation can't continue to go on the way it is. Uh, and the cons also are that it doesn't meet OPRD stated project goals. Dike breach, this has the highest estuary restoration value, but it would put tidal water on private property and therefore does not meet OPRD's stated project goals. Modern tide gates in the existing dike offers kind of a medium ground. I mean, it provides some fish passage benefit, but not as good as the setback dike. Also the existing dike and, uh, and you know, its structure, both in terms of its size, its footprint, et cetera, they don't meet modern uh, flood control standards, and the dike is too low to withstand any kind of sea level rise. It would be pretty expensive as well to install these modern tide gates for really what would amount to kind of a band-aid approach. Setback dike, on the other hand, provides um, restoration benefits in the marsh and for fish passage that are second to none, really, in terms of acceptability, and that it, uh, it, uh, well, it's 
it, it would be resilient to sea level rise in some sense because of the sediment accumulation that can happen when tides are allowed to naturally flow. It's less erosive than something that would have a small aperture like a modern tide gate. And um, the stormwater benefits are probably best of anything that's been considered. The cons would be that it would be constructed through high value wetland. This The footprint of the setback dike would be about 1.5 acres and the, the mechanical tide gate structure would require some maintenance. It's also expensive. So in 2020, with all of these pros and cons weighed, OPRD selected the new setback dike as the alternative to further assess. And this graphic here shows a cross section of what the existing dike looks like in comparison to the new setback dike dimensions. As you can see, the existing setback dike at its low point is dramatically smaller and less resilient to sea level rise than would be the modern um, setback dike. So in 2020, uh, OPRD forged a relationship with Tillamook Estuaries Partnership to start to work on finding grant funds to be able to advance design further and, and continue to explore the setback dike alternative. And uh, grants have been received already, and a, a recent grant has allowed for, uh, for funds sufficient to be able to bring us to 100% design. We're currently at 30% design. That work since 2020 has involved a study that involved assessing a range of different potential setback dike scenarios to sort of feel out where they would best work. You don't know where exactly to put it until you sort of test it. It's one of those situations where empirical testing has to take place to really understand how much storage water capacity is necessary to be able to uh, handle stormwater that's flowing from the Tierra del Mar area and needing to be stored while the tide gate is closed. Also, as part of this study, uh, ESA assessed the stormwater um, situation in Tierra del Mar, including low areas that accumulate water and the adequacy or lack thereof of ditching and draining that would allow for better drainage of the neighborhood. This study involved what, what I've been calling tapping on the wall to find the studs. We're kind of knocking in different places to see where does this work and where doesn't it? And so moving from south to north, knocking here, this doesn't meet our goals. It doesn't store enough storm water. Same with alternatives three and two, they can't store enough storm water during a, a big storm event when a tide gate would be closed in the setback dike. Alternative one, on the other hand, is far enough north that it has ample and adequate storage capacity to hold stormwater during a period of time in which the tides would have closed the tide gate. So alternative one is the Goldilocks zone. That's the spot that meets all of OPRD's stated goals. And uh, that's the only spot that really works in the analysis that's been done to the 30% design point. Here's a view of what a setback dike alignment might look like from the early conceptual uh, locations. So this is just north of a beaver dam complex, and it's, uh, it's in the area that's just south of Belts Creek. So this allows full unfettered access to both Renneke and Belts Creek. Muted tidal regulator, of course, would be installed here to allow water flows to escape from the setback dike to the north during stormwater situations. So effects on habitat, um, 1.5 acres of habitat would be covered by a new setback dike if it were constructed. The project would restore 70 acres of natural estuarine conditions that are currently skewed towards freshwater conditions and had been drained when the, uh, the tide gate was fully functioning in Belts Dike. The natural tide cycle would be restored in 78% of the land within the range of tides behind the existing dike and 85% of the marsh that's within park boundaries. Higher tides north of the setback dike would provide fish passage and aquatic wildlife foraging and rearing habitat in areas previously not receiving tides and seawater. So this means that the 
the range of estuarine habitat would expand according to that um, elevational tidal gain that would happen around the, the bathtub ring of the marsh. And I'll have a figure on that later. Full fish, fish passage would be restored to the mouths of Belt, Belts and Renneke Creek and sediment accretion from uh, the breach would allow estuarine conditions north of the setback to keep pace with sea level rise, or that is, at least is more possible than if it were to be behind a dike where sediment was not being accumulated. Effects on habitat. So this graphic shows what habitats currently exist as of 2016 when our vegetation mapping was done. This is what was present inside the dike. And we have modeled what vegetation might shift to inside the dike with a setback dike in place. As you can see, there's a lot more of this purple color, which is low salt marsh, which is excellent rearing habitat for salmonids and an important type of estuarine conditions from a conservation standpoint. Here again, that same thing, but in a pie chart, big winners here are uh, low salt marsh. The setback dike would be placed through habitat that varies from poor condition in red, medium condition in, in yellow, and good to excellent in these other shades of green. So the, the setback dike would be in high quality marsh without question, although there are some areas of that alignment that would be in poor condition as well, mostly because of uh, invasive species presence. We have high resolution vegetation and habitat data for the whole area inside the marsh and can easily characterize the gains and losses of particular types of habitats within the marsh. So fixed to private property, the setback dike would block all tidal access to uh, private properties. And there would sometimes be stormwater accumulation that could come up in, into private property, but to much lesser extent than is currently the case. The setback dike is a dramatic improvement over the existing condition. So here's what I talked about before, the bathtub ring around the edge of the marsh. The green is, is area that is currently below the tidal level because of the muted tides that we receive inside the dike. The small uh, hourglass-like aperture through this, this dike allows water to come in to a certain level in here in yellow, but not to reach the full level that is experienced outside of the dike. By adding this additional 1.3 to 1.7 feet of tidal reach in elevation inside the dike, we would be effectively gaining uh, 5.6 acres of re-wetted estuary. And that was historic estuary and has since been drained as a result of the um, dike's function. The next steps of the study are to uh, conduct geotechnical assessment of technical constructability, and then to move forward with continuing uh, planning and design up to 100%. And with that, I finished the history lesson on uh, Sitka Sedge, and uh, would I guess we'll hold questions until the end and hand it over to Hunter. You're muted. Hunter. All right. Yeah. Trying to find all the buttons there. Uh, thanks, Noel. And uh, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Hunter White. I'm the water resources engineer and project manager for ESA, uh, leading a team of ESA staff, a multidisciplinary team of, of ESA staff and sub consultants to advance this project forward to final design and, and permitting. Um, let's see. Are you all seeing my my screen? my presentation slides. Yes. yes. Thanks, Dennis. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just give you an update here on uh, the 30% design of the project, uh, where, where we're currently at. Uh, during the most recent phase of the project, we, as Noel described in great detail there, um, evaluated the 
kind of the ideal or optimum location for a new setback dike. Uh, we looked at uh, evaluating the size and dimensions of a dike breach and how to maintain that trail access through a pedestrian bridge or boardwalk. Um, and we evaluated uh, the, the drainage structure and tide gate system that would be involved in the setback dike to, again, prevent peak tides from reaching the private properties in Tierra del Mar, but also having enough storage capacity to contain the stormwater and uh, lower water levels that are currently experienced under the existing condition. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of uh, excerpts from our 30% design plans, which I believe all of you have had access to, um, and I'll start zooming in on each one of these elements. So again, starting with the dike breach and pedestrian bridge here at the north end of the project area, uh, the setback dike across the south end of the marsh just north of the main existing beaver dam. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about other potential interior marsh enhancements such as tidal channel um, enhancements, filling existing linear drainage ditches, adding large wood, uh, and other vegetation and habitat enhancements. Starting with the dike breach and pedestrian bridge, um, the plans currently show a 200 foot wide dike breach and a 200 foot span pedestrian bridge. Uh, we'll be working in the next phase here to refine both of those features. Uh, we have David Evans and associates on our team as a structural uh, bridge engineer who will be working with us and OPRD to, to um, gain consensus or, or really determine what we want this bridge to look like aesthetically, uh, material composition, and, and even span. So again, at this point, we're showing a 200 foot breach and, and bridge span, and we'll be evaluating the cost of a bridge like that, as well as options to potentially reduce that while uh, making sure that we're not uh, creating, you know, um, trade-offs in hydraulic performance or erodibility or the ability for this site to manage sediment uh, through this hydraulic opening. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of what a prefabricated pedestrian bridge could look like. Um, and again, we'll be, be working to refine that. Uh, not that the Sicka Sedge Bridge will look like any of these, but these are a few examples of prefabricated bridges in this span range. We also, as Noel said, looked at a boardwalk option to maintain trail access um, as an alternative to a bridge. At this point, we are proceeding with the bridge option, um, and we may still consider the boardwalk option until we've confirmed that the permitting pathway uh, is is um, is confirmed that we can build the build the bridge. And for example, if there's a firm requirement to balance cut and fill within the floodplain, uh, then additional dike removal may be required to offset the fill associated with the setback dike itself. Uh, there are other locations we could consider for fill uh, excavation for offsetting that, but uh, just kind of keeping this on the table until we've confirmed that path forward. The the breach itself, of course, goes along with the bridge. And what we're looking at now is is a profile of the dike breach. Uh, you can see this this grading that we have developed here. And this profile is showing the existing dike kind of trapezoid here and you know, in a lot of sites that we work on, when we are, are breaching dikes or we're creating new tidal channels, often that elevation is much lower. It's, you know, typically down in the zero foot elevation range. Uh, Sand Lake is a bit of a unique situation because of the partial tidal cycle that is experienced here. Uh, because of the bed features out in Sand Lake, the tide never falls below five feet or so, um, as opposed to, you know, draining all the way out to zero feet. And so, when we initially look at creating a new channel opening, we would we would expect to ex excavate that channel deeper, uh, but we want to pay attention to you know what we're connecting to on either side, um, how this feature would evolve in the future with all of this new water rushing in and out of it on a daily basis and and through larger events, um, and then consider you know what's the proper extent of of breach channel excavation that makes sense here. Uh, and then just to kind of drive this home, you know, out in Sand Lake where this connection would be made, that that sand bed feature out there is at about five feet. Um, and so, you know, what's shown here right now is kind of creating a big sink that 
could have the tendency to fill in and, and really may not be necessary to dig that that deep. So that's that's kind of a unique condition that we'll be evaluating moving forward. And you know, as you can see at the existing culvert location, there are these big deep scour holes on either side, you know, going down to zero and negative four, I think is even the deepest spot here. Obviously, uh, developed based on this constriction and the fire hose effect that Noel mentioned, um, you know, creating scour on either side. We would expect that the new breach location would also scour out more than than what it is now, but you know, likely not to the extent of this you know, highly constricted opening that's out there right now. Um, now turning towards the setback dike itself, and uh, this is the 30% design, so a little bit more detailed than the than the graphic that Noel had shown, and uh, I'll start to, excuse me, hone in on some of the specific features here. So again, running this setback dike straight across the wetland, uh, just 50 feet or so north, 50 to 100 feet north of the existing main beaver dam. And uh, that's intentional in a few ways, both from a stormwater storage perspective, as well as uh, trying to mitigate the effect of the beaver activity here and essentially kind of, you know, giving the beavers the south 10 acres of the marsh to essentially maintain as it is right now uh, with the hopes that that will take some pressure off of our new infrastructure if we are kind of, you know, allowing them to uh, thrive in the area behind the setback dike. Uh, talk about some other features that we'll be considering there as well. Um, so I'll start to just zoom in on on each one of these. And uh, Noel showed a conceptual cross section of the setback dike, and this is uh, a little bit further along, I guess, just in that, you know, we're looking at where we're actually tying into elevation wise with the setback dike. Uh, uh, we're looking at a crest elevation of 15 feet in a VD88 uh, datum, and uh, that's about three feet higher than the low point in the existing dike, and also intentionally providing three feet of freeboard over the 100 year or, or peak tide elevations that we see out there. Um, this blue line here is showing that 12 foot water level, which is the you know, approximately the peak tide. And just to show that on the outboard side of the dike that we're talking about just about three to four feet of water depth, that would be up against the uh, the outboard side of the dike. And then, you know, with stormwater, in, you know, incoming behind the dike, there are moments where water can be elevated to similar levels on the inside. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, geotechnical engineering considerations are a big aspect of our work looking ahead at designing the setback dike. Um, settlement will be, um, you know, it's almost a given as we're building, placing all of this fill over this these soft marsh soils will likely experience several feet of settlement uh, of the underlying soil. And so we would plan to overbuild the height of this dike by several feet. Uh, likely need to build it over two years to allow that settlement to take place and then top it off to our desired finished elevations um, and likely extensive work needed in the subgrade uh, beneath the footprint of that dike to, to manage the soft soils uh, through, you know, over excavation and subgrade stabilization measures. Uh, we do have Shannon and Wilson is our geotechnical engineer for this project, and uh, we are moving ahead with a two phase geotechnical investigation. I won't go through all of this. But this is just to show the, the yellow highlighted elements here are essentially drilling uh, in all these kind of easier access areas on the existing dike where uh, the new pedestrian bridge would go, uh, as well as at the creek crossings of Renicky Belts and No Name Creek, uh, where we're proposing new, new structures that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then in a second phase of drilling uh, in, you know, over the next year, we would need to be collecting data out in the footprint of the, the setback dike and, and proposed tie gate structure out there. Uh, so now zooming in a little bit on the tie gate structure itself, uh, currently planning for a 12 foot wide box culvert uh, with an eight foot by 10 foot wide side hinge tie gate uh, with muted tidal regular control system. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit too about this red fencing that we're showing there. As I you know, mentioned, we're showing the, the existing beaver dam and noting that this is in an area of, of high beaver activity and uh, likely will need some exclusionary measures or, or other considerations for uh, keeping this structure functional and, and you know, managing the maintenance versus uh, exclusion 
um, features there. Uh, you'll see here a extra kind of a backup culvert that we've added to the design where, you know, as, as much as we will be working to maintain and, and prevent blockages of this structure, uh, we're proposing to add a couple of backup culverts that will, in the event of a blockage or even just to add capacity to drain out the higher water levels, uh, a couple of extra 36 inch diameter culverts to, uh, they would be elevated up a little bit higher that they wouldn't normally have water flowing through them and so it would be less attractive for a beaver to block uh, but then also again just provide backup drainage capacity to um, yeah it's kind of a fail-safe backup method um, we are starting to show some details of what this structure would look like and a lot of this is based on other similar systems that we and our, our team has designed um, i won't get in too deep into the details here but just to show you kind of the level of detail we're at right now, uh, and we'll be working with our geotechnical engineer, as I mentioned, as well as our um, structural engineer, PSE consulting engineers. Uh, they're structural engineer that have designed uh, several uh, of these very similar tight get structures uh, in settings like this. Uh, now, just to kind of turn to the beaver activity considerations, and again, we're showing this red fencing around this. Um, and we'll be working with, um, and, and yeah, I guess just to show you kind of the setting that we're talking about, you know, this is approximately the location of the, the setback dike and the main beaver dam kind of pointed at in the background here. Uh, you know, beavers are present and will likely remain after, after reconnection. Uh, and, you know, they have dams throughout the channel network now. And, uh, you know, beavers do, block culverts when it's beneficial for their habitat to create ponding area, which obviously has drainage and flooding implications and, and maintenance implications to keep these uh, facilities operational. Uh, you know, we're looking at a lot of ways to mitigate that effect, um, you know, through frequent monitoring and maintenance of the system. We're including a dike top access road that would provide access to, to conduct that maintenance and monitoring. Uh, again, I said we're, we're leaving the south end of the marsh essentially as is the beaver uh, habitat that's there and uh, kind of giving them their 10 acres and you know with with the hopes that it, again that takes pressure off of our new infrastructure uh, looking at width depth and and substrate a you know smooth concrete bottom and, and things like that to make the features harder da to dam uh, we have on our team for this phase uh, skip lyle he's from uh, a group called Beavers Deceivers International. He's the original inventor of the Beaver Deceiver device, as well as other flow devices uh, that we'll be considering for this structure. Uh, and then, as I already mentioned, providing some redundant backup culverts that would that would uh, drain off high water in, in the event that um, the main tide gate structure were blocked. These are a couple of examples, uh, one in King County of trapezoidal fencing, uh, excluding beaver from a kind of similar sized box culvert uh, to what we're proposing. Uh, this is one of Skip's devices of, of a beaver deceiver uh, at a, a smaller culvert, but just to give an example of some of the uh, potential exclusionary features that we're talking about. Um, Skip also has designed several flow devices, uh, one called the Caster Master that is essentially um, provides kind of an alternate pathway for water to, to drain through a structure like this, uh, bypassing the beaver dam, for example. So again, uh, have his expertise on our team to evaluate this, and we'll be conducting some uh, field surveys and, and design coordination next month. Uh, we will be tying into Sam Lake Road on the east end and uh, kind of ramping upward to meet that road at its current elevation. Uh, again, one of our extra drainage culvert showing up here. And then at the, the far end of the setback dike, we would have a vehicular turnaround so that you know maintenance trucks that make their way down the dike would have the opportunity to turn around. Um, and this is tying into the forested dune on that west end. And so uh, again, just kind of showing that, that tie-in feature there. Um, we are, you know, again, when we approach sites like this, you know, we typically want to fill the linear straight line drainage ditches that have been excavated and, and re-meander, kind of naturalize the tidal channel network, uh, add large wood habitat structures into the site. Uh, and 
you know, we, we do want to do that here. I think we want to also be cognizant of the fact that getting into this area because it is already connected and it is high quality marsh that we want to consider the trade-offs of, you know, the impacts that would be involved in accessing this area as well as doing excavation and importing wood. And so, you know, we'll definitely be working with OPRD and, and other stakeholders to uh, weigh those pros and cons and uh, determine, you know, how extensive of interior marsh enhancements we want to get into. Um, that's kind of the summary of the Sika Sedge uh, project design. And here's just a summary of the current uh, engineer's opinion of probable construction cost uh, coming in at about $6.6 .6 million. Uh, you can see some of the categories here, you know, the setback dike itself, about 1.5, uh, the tide gate structure and MTR system, you know, closer to 700,000. And, and, you know, we are still, even though there's been a, a lot of work getting us to this point, we are still at an early stage in design. So carrying a, a relatively large contingency uh, here uh, for potential changes that we'll be looking at moving ahead and, and you know, other items that may not be accounted for at this point. So I'll kind of pause there and and um, maybe, you know, Noel or Krister, I don't know if we wanted to take any comments or questions at this point or uh, proceed with additional content. Yeah, I think let's go ahead and let Chris present his uh, few slides here and then we'll take questions right after that. Okay. <clears throat> So concurrent to the work done on Sitka Sedge, I contracted with ESA um, and their subcontractor, David Evans and a subconsultant, their, uh, David Evans and Associates, to go through a type size location to determine a better crossing point for that. Uh, they're completed with a hydraulic and geomorphic, uh, geomorphic analysis and identifying where that stream should go. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So if you'll see, Renike Creek is the one that's located furthest to the north. Uh, that used to cross under Sand Lake uh, at a couple different locations. One goes back to a 14-foot bridge. Uh, that bridge was subsequently removed and a culvert was installed. So the creek wanted to flow perpendicular to, um, uh, perpendicular to Sand Lake Road. But the issue with that was that culvert was actually blocked. Um, and then on the downstream side of that, it silted in so much. So the river, the creek wanted to do was it turned and started flowing down the roadside ditch. So the low point in that whole channel is a current culvert that cannot carry the capacity. So it overtops the road at that particular location every year, several times a year. Um, the What ends up happening with that is that the water, as it goes over the road, it wants to continually undermine uh, the asphalt on that location. So when we get, there we go. Uh, that's actually, it's uh, been undermined several times since then. We actually paved the road uh, through here knowing that it was sacrificial, but the road was just getting in such a, a poor uh, condition. So this is an area that carries a lot of sediment. Um, so the type size location report as we go through it has been completed. I'm getting bounced around over the place. Uh, Hunter, sorry about that. Um, so go ahead and bump um, back one slide, two slides now. There we go. So we'll jump in a little bit more in the details, but they've completed the 30% design um, and the it's identified that a bridge is the proper uh, location for this. Uh, subsequently, we'll show some stream alignment with that. Uh, the project does have funding for 100% uh, designed through to get sit, excuse me Renke Creek up uh, and belts and uh, no name Creek to 30% design. County Public Works has applied for a federal highway uh, AOP grant money to try to build the structure. Let's go ahead and bump two slides forward. So when we were going through there, I'll actually let Hunter uh, speak on uh, this slide as we start looking at some of the um, the the next couple slides. Um, He'll get this slide and then I'll get the next slide. Go ahead. Yeah. And so, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, I'll get a little bit more into the rationale of, of you know, confirming that this is the, the best location to put a new bridge, um, as well as some of the stream restoration to get Renneke Creek out of this roadside ditch where it currently flows and reactivate and, and restore some of the 
uh, forested floodplain and, and alluvial fan conditions that uh, that we've evaluated. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more. And then here's kind of the roadway and bridge uh, information. You know, we're looking so at I'll, elevating the road. Yep, yeah. a couple of feet. Go ahead, Chris. And I'll touch on this, and then we'll, we kind of jump back and forth just a little bit with that. So one of the things that we caught up here is that obviously the the um, the the creek is not should not be in a roadside ditch. So this particular case, we would raise the road up about three feet on this. Uh, we would be built, it would be approximately 49 feet long, uh, 28 feet wide. And that allows us to build one lane to the road at a time so we can keep traffic uh, flowing through there. Uh, it ends up raising it about uh, 33 feet, which causes, excuse me, three feet, which causes about 775 feet of road. So instead of the creek coming down and hitting the road and flowing down a roadside ditch, which is obviously not viable, uh, further detail went into really where should the stream be? Get it back to more of a historic channel, back to Hunter. And so, you know, we really wanted to zoom out and, and confirm that, you know, we do think this is the right place for the new bridge. And there has been discussion about, you know, restoring Renneke Creek through a man-made essentially a ditch feature um, around the old, around the Sicka Sedge parking lot and to flow out kind of the east end of the of the existing dike. Um, and so again, we really just wanted to take a step back and look at what this area has, you know, looks like from a, a geomorphology perspective and and kind of historical analysis of what has happened to this area and this creek over time. Um, we this is a LIDAR uh, image of the Renneke Creek area here in the bottom left showing uh, this kind of fanned out uh, elevated land surface of, of sediment deposits. Up here in the top of the screen, we're seeing just a kind of a schematic representation of an alluvial fan. Uh, this feature is common where a steep mountain stream uh, is carrying a lot of sediment in, in a high slope condition, and then it hits the flat valley, has a tendency to drop that sediment out. And over you know centuries and, and millennia, um, actually, you know, shift its channel location all, all over this fan. And, you know, after a pulse of sediment comes through and fills in one of the old channels, it would switch over and, and form a new channel. And, and that process would just continue over and over again, uh, resulting in this fan feature. So that's that's what we see out here, um, elevation analysis for Renneke Creek. Uh, then here is just, uh, you know, as far back as we can look in historical aerial photos back to 1939, um, identifying a few key features here. So uh, circled here in orange are the, you know, tidal channels and kind of the multiple channels within the Renneke Creek area that, that likely, uh, carried Renneke Creek's flows again, even before the Sand Lake Road went in, probably, you know, spreading out all across this area. Um, you'll see as we move forward through time in the fifties, this area, all these channels were filled in, um, with construction of the dike and, uh, agricultural use of that land. Uh, you know, into the 70s, again, we're, we're still, you know, filled in kind of a very simplified condition here. This is where in the 50s, we see Renneke's kind of man-made canal channel pop up. Um, this channel's filled in several times, it, you know, required a lot of maintenance. And, and, um, and then most recently, the culvert that connected to this area completely buried with, with sediment. Um, the other feature to note here is this triangular patch of forest that is still uh, exists today. Um, this is kind of the remnant portion of the, the forested wetland um, that is still present today. And you can see just over time, this area being cleared and Renneke Creek being boxed into its single threaded channel that, that exists still today. Um, so, you know, the other way of looking at this is what happens when we get high flows on Renneke Creek. Uh, this is existing conditions hydraulic modeling, and so when we reach, you know, over a two-year or, or higher uh, recurrence interval flood events, uh, water pops out of the Renneke Creek channel and flows across this area down to this low point, this kind of triangular forested wetland. And so, you know, just to say, even if a bridge or a new structure was put in at this old block culvert location, during high flows, water escapes the creek much further upstream and will will continue to flow down to this location. And so it's a it's critical that a new structure goes in here and it makes a lot of sense to realign Renneke Creek away from the roadside ditch. And uh, also what we're showing is 
uh, you know, when we look down in this forested wetland area, you can see these kind of remnant channels that that do still exist within this forested wetland area. Uh, you know, these are a couple photos, a little bit hard to see, but just on the ground that there are still these existing channels that do convey water, you know, picking up groundwater and, and then high flows that escape the creek flow down through this area to the low point. And so what we're proposing is to fill, you know, fill Renneke's old channel as it approaches the roadway, uh, construct a new main channel for Renneke Creek uh, in this location that already has a tendency to pop out um, high flows, and then also create a series of side channels and, and really expect this to evolve over time into a multi-threaded uh, channel system, likely with a lot of, you know, beaver activity and, and great beaver habitat. Um, and, and really, you know, even though we're, you know, we don't really have the ability to restore all of the kind of alluvial fan area that Renneke once occupied, uh, this is our attempt at restoring as much of that natural condition as we can. Uh, and then, of course, um, providing uh, new, much improved fish passage through the, the new bridge at Sand Lake Road. So I'm going to do a final wrap up on that bridge. So because we anticipate building the bridge in one lane and then turn around and build the other lane, that results in wide shoulders. Uh, this road does get a lot of bike traffic and through hikers uh, walking down the Pacific coast. So having a shoulder through this piece is actually a, you know, a good thing. That's kind of a side benefit for, for this particular project. All this work couldn't be done. The upstream work uh, could not be done without this being on OPRD's property. So it's a significant benefit to uh, the project, the crossing and habitat. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And then, yeah, I guess maybe we can go ahead and just have Luke uh, give us a quick permitting overview and looks like we'll have about a half hour for uh, discussion and questions and, and comments. Sounds good, thanks. Thanks, Hunter. So, hello, everyone. My name is Luke Johnson. I'm a permitting specialist at ESA and a watershed ecologist. And I'm sorry, I wasn't uh, able to introduce myself earlier. So, for um, y'all hearing this for the first time or the first time in the wild, you might be thinking, okay, 30% designs are all fine and dandy, but how are you going to permit uh, this project? And so, I'm going to talk about that briefly at a high level without going into the nitty gritty here. Um, and so <clears throat> our permitting approach, as we understand it, can be kind of clustered into two large umbrella permits. So the first being um, the section 404 of the Clean Water Act removal fill permit. So both the Army Corps of Engineers at the federal level and the Oregon Department of State Lands at the state level regulate um, cut, removal, and fill of um, two protected water resources uh, at uh, it's known as the waters of the United States and waters of the state. And in applying for these two permits um, through what's called the joint permit application, it triggers review by multiple federal and state agencies. And I'll go into that in a second, um, ensuring that all of the basis from an environmental and a cultural resources standpoint are covered uh, before um, deploying any cut or fill to these protected uh, water resources. Next, our uh, umbrella or cluster of permits is related to the Tillamook County's land use review. And as you'll see here on the next slide here in a second that, um, both this federal perm federal and state permit process with the Clean Water Act and the Tillamook County uh, Land Use Review have various sub permits or uh, applications that tie into each other. So while I'm presenting them today as kind of two separate umbrellas, they actually um, intertwine with each other uh, in a num number of different ways that um, not necessarily going to go into detail here. So here is um, our the beginning of our summary of all of the permits that are included in the Section 404 Removal Fill Permit. And I'm just going to um, kind of mention each of them here. So you'll see the, the at the top here um, is Waters of the United States <clears throat> um, permit application. And, and 
Um, in that, we describe the, the water resources, including wetlands, streams, and tidal areas that will be affected and how they'll be affected. And uh, we describe them in detail going through uh, a regulated kind of delineation process. There's, there's a protocol for drawing the boundaries of your wetlands, your estuaries, and your streams. And we plan to follow that. And then so in doing that, you trigger um, a biological assessment for the species in the project area and the project area vicinity um, that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. And so we will develop a rigorous document describing um, all of the species protected under the Endangered Species Act expected to be in the project vicinity and how this project may or may not affect um, their life histories and or their habitat. Next is uh, the federal agency. And this is one of those that um, relates directly to the land use application, but we will go through a FEMA uh, floodplain review process where we'll analyze how this project may or may not affect um, the regulated floodplain elevations through the eyes of FEMA. Um, then we will, or in concurrent to all of this, um, and a big element will be section 106, which is the federal law um, that regulates effects to cultural resources and, and national, nationally registered places. And we will be working closely with the State Historic Preservation Office, which happens to be housed within Oregon, uh, Oregon, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. And um, and so with them, we have a, a strong partner in uh, figuring out uh, this project's consequences to cultural resources and uh, protected artifacts. So next slide. And then last, um, kind of the, the lesser involved projects that still fit within this section 404 umbrella are um, things regulated under the national pollution discharge elimination system, uh, which is um, effectively a permit required in all construction projects, pretty much in the state, ensuring that your project doesn't uh, pollute uh, with fuels and uh, flammable liquids and things like that, but also uh, sediments. Um, and uh, similarly, the project will require um, compliance monitoring of water quality in the construction area vicinity through this water quality certification. And we'll have to show that to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, that uh, fish passage, that um, the fish can freely and voluntarily uh, enter and exit the areas uh, where fish passage would be affected. Um, and then kind of the last, the caboose of, of this whole section 404 project um, or process is the Oregon Department of um, the DLCD will do a Oregon Coastal Management Review um, to ensure that hazards related uh, to living near the coast are not um, exacerbated as a result of this project. Um, and <laughs> uh, this federal permit will also require a notice from Tillamook County that says this project is compatible with land use code in the county. And so in order to get that thing, we will need to uh, go through a rigorous review with Tillamook County. And so first and foremost, uh, it's completion of what we anticipate to be a type three land use application. Um, and that will trigger a number of other different reviews uh, through the county and their state and federal partnering agencies. And, so, and for both of these, I wish I would have prefaced to say that, you know, because we're still in the early stages of design at 30%, we're at the very early stages of permitting. And so, you know, your project concepts and designs should be fairly mature before you begin these conversations so that you understand what the impacts to the protected resources are. Um, and so we are launching into what we call pre-application meetings with most of all the agencies I just uh, mentioned and more to, to really delineate our path and, and which forms and applications the project needs to complete over the next couple of years. 
Um, and so we will be doing that very shortly here with Tillamook County. And uh, we anticipate that through this type through la type three land use application, it will trigger uh, a number of overlays that the county currently has. And it will likely trigger um, a, a larger uh, uh, amendment to existing uh, planning documents that the county currently has in place because the project may not be in alignment with current zoning that the city has. Um, and in part, because of that, it would also trigger a review at the state level uh, to ensure that this project is consistent with the statewide planning goals that the state uh, hands off to the county to implement. Um, so you can see the beginning of uh, some of the circularity and entanglement that um, each of these permits kind of has with one another. Um, and so with that, that's the general uh, overview as we begin uh, this journey this month. Awesome, thank you, Luke. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that concludes our, our presentation slides. And yeah, go ahead, Christopher. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, the same thing you're just saying. That's, that's the end of our slide decks. Um, so we got 25 minutes for questions. So that's pretty good. Um, so we'll open it up for questions at this point. Um, if you could either raise your hand or put something in the chat, then I can um, call on you. No questions, that cannot be. <laughs> well, I guess we did a pretty thorough job then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> questions, feedback. Uh, yeah, again, I, I talked through a couple unique features, the, the dike breach and you know, shallow channel elevations will be tying into, which is kind of unique to to this setting compared to a lot of other estuary and and uh, breaching locations. And I'm kind of curious of others' thoughts or experiences, or you know, encountering similar shallow uh, channel situations like that. See, so York has a hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is just a comment. Um, I just wanted to say that um, these presentations were excellent. You know, I've been involved with this project for a long time, and it was a very succinct culmination of all the different challenges that we've gone through in iterations. So I really appreciate, Noel, your history and Hunter, um, your summary of the work. Um, and Luke, uh, I feel bad for all of the entanglements with the permitting that you're going to get involved in, but it was just a really excellent summary. And I think you highlighted all the nuances and details in a really understandable and digestible manner. So thank you. Thanks, York. Awesome. Thank you, York. Well, I guess I could add uh, just a couple of words about um, project funding. So we have um, received NOAA funding through their fisheries program um, to fund 100% design, like Hunter mentioned. Um, but I just wanted to mention that's where the funding was coming from. And we are applying, well, DLCD will be applying um, with Tillamook Estuaries Partnership as sort of a subcontractor. Um, for an, another federal uh, a NOAA grant to help fund a whole bunch of the implementation. So that application will be going in um, in a couple of months. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now with funding. But we are funded through 100% Design um, with ESA as our contractors. Um, so we, that's, a, that's a big deal because we were stalled out because of a lack of funding for uh, six months plus. So... And I know we have a lot of agency folks on the call here. And and just to know that, uh, as Luke said, you know, we'll be arranging pre-application meetings to to walk through um, with each one of your agencies about the uh, permitting pathways ahead and, and thoughts and uh, feedback and concern about the project. So uh, if you don't uh, want to chime in today, uh, know that we'll be having some discussions with you coming up in the near future. So. 
one of the things when we look at the bridge, uh, part of this is we did that concurrent so that we could, if we received funding, could go through construction faster uh, than Sitka Sedge. It would be on its own independent path of uh, going through the, the permitting process. Uh, it, uh, it Chances are possibly we can get this thing built before Sitka Sedge. They can be built independently. Yeah, and that's a that's a good point that we're uh, you know at this point we have had moved Renneke Creek forward on its on its own track uh, with some funding and and uh, oversight by the county. Uh, you know our current contract now does in, include both, and we're advancing them together. Um, and as we, you know, as Luke described, kind of untangle the permitting pathways ahead. We'll be looking at you know is it advantageous to try to permit them together as a single. Uh, project or or break them up, and similarly with construction and and bidding out a project like this, if um, you know keeping those options open for combining or or splitting as as most advantageous. Uh, see a hand up from Tim. Yeah, uh, just kind of curious with the the bridge over the breach the dike breach, um, going that direction rather than the boardwalk. Is there can you go more into the rationale for that or um, how those compare? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, the bridge would be a lower maintenance uh, option compared to a boardwalk. Boardwalk would probably require a lot of treated wood and replacing treated wood and potential you know, debris jams and stuff that could damage the diamond pier posts, et cetera, but we, we are still leaving the door open to the potential for having a boardwalk if that turns out to be either required because of needing to balance the, the fill and removal, or if, uh, you know, costs are prohibitive or the door is just kind of, there's a ray of light still there for a boardwalk, but the bridge is a lower maintenance and simpler opportunity. Yeah, and, and much much lower cost in our our comparison analysis. Uh, I mean, I showed that bridge that uh, you know still to be defined, but could be in on the order of a million dollars. And uh, the boardwalk option was coming in closer to three to five million dollars. Um, you know, I um, we would be talking about a you know half a mile of boardwalk, so so not a short feature, and you know the boardwalk itself would have its own impacts of of crossing the marsh and then maintenance implications, you know maybe paramount to all of that, but it, but again the cost was also uh, quite a bit higher with the boardwalk option than the bridge. Oh, thank you. Well, all right. If nobody has anything else they want to uh, ask about, we will give everybody 15 minutes back to their day. And uh, like I said earlier, the um, the town hall meeting invite has gone out to uh, the community and we will be um, providing more details uh, to come for that. And uh, we hope to see the community there um, at that meeting and you know share the for all of you as well everyone's welcome to that uh yeah. town hall meeting yeah yeah thanks everybody and, and please do follow up if you have questions or comments and uh yeah thanks again for your time really appreciate it thanks everybody thank you